started to find is that technologies and people have been coming together more and more. This is actually a photo taken uh, earlier this year on the side of a bus on our uh, Clayton campus at Monash. And it's an advertisement for cough medicine. And the idea with this advertisement is that you can switch off your cough like you'd switch on or off uh, something on one of your mobile devices, maybe your mobile phone. The idea that people and technologies are entangled or intertwined is something that appears to be coming more and more into our daily lives. One of the things that I'm really uh, fortunate to be able to do as part of my work is to travel and speak to lots of different people, often in face-to-face -face settings, obviously not at the moment, which is why we're having a webinar like this. But when I travel throughout various parts of the world, the idea that people and technologies have this intimate daily connection is revealed in lots of other buses. So in Indonesia, we start to see advertisements like this looking for uh, faster streaming. When I traveled to Vietnam last year, you see buses like this advertising digital technologies and the connection between us and particularly mobile technologies is becoming stronger and stronger. If we actually have a look at some data from Australia uh, from last year, we had nearly 25 million people in Australia, but we had 32 and a half million nearly mobile phone connections, smartphone connections. So we actually had more smartphones than we had people in the country. The device to population percentage was actually 130%. We had 130% devices compared to the number of people. And when you think that smartphones have only been around for 11 years, that's quite a remarkable push into society. And as I said, traveling around the world, we see similar kinds of patterns. So if you actually go to Africa, to Ghana, they actually have the same device to population percentage, 130%. If we have a look in Indonesia, um, then we actually see that it's slightly higher, but have a look at how many mobile phones are in Indonesia. 355 million mobile phones, quite extraordinary. Um, if we look uh, to Singapore, it's a little higher, 144%. In Vietnam, higher again, 148%. And if we end up going to the United Arab Emirates, we get to 200% device to population, two mobile devices for every single person in that country. So the fact that we have these devices, we have access to these devices, means we're now able to do things in different kinds of ways. But it can also lead to different kinds of challenges. One of those is this idea of nomophobia or a mental illness caused by essentially the lack of technology, not having um, a, a phone, so being without it or not having a signal is a, a mental illness that's been known to affect nearly 53% of British men, women and teenagers owning a mobile phone. The fact that we are so connected through our devices um, is apparent when we start to actually have a look at what we do on our devices. And if you're a student or if you're teaching uh, teenagers or younger people, one of the things that I bet that they're doing is Facebook. 2.32 billion active monthly users per year. And this is one uh, statistic that gets me every time I see it. Every 60 seconds on Facebook, over half a million comments are posted. Half a million comments every 60 seconds is quite remarkable. So one of the things I'd like you to think about and take a guess at is what percentage of 18 to 24 year olds you think go on Facebook before they even get out of bed in the morning? Well, if you think around 50%, you'd be right. Half of the teenage, 18 to 24 year olds who have Facebook look at it before they even get out of bed in the morning. This is how entangled we become with our devices. YouTube's another one of the things that I think probably particularly at the moment might be Netflix or YouTube. A lot of video gets watched and these, this data comes from uh, pre-COVID. Um, if we actually have a look at this, 300 hours of video are being uploaded to YouTube every single minute. And the average mobile viewing session lasts for more than 40 minutes. People are engaging with this material in ways that are deep and meaningful. They're not just watching silly cat videos, they're actually engaging with things and probably learning lots of different things from these kind of platforms. 
I wonder if you can guess what uh, country watches the most YouTube around the world. You might be thinking the US, you'd be wrong. You might be thinking the USA, uh, sorry, you might be thinking the UK, you might be wrong. You might be thinking Australia, and again, you'd be wrong. Actually, it's Malaysians. Malaysians watch more YouTube than any other country in the world per capita. While those kinds of statistics are amazing, if we go back to Facebook and we go think about video, 100 million hours of videos are being watched on that one platform per day. If you were to watch 100 million hours of video, it would take you nearly 11 and a half thousand years. We have this huge entanglement with our devices. We are so connected to those in so many different components of our daily lives. We consume so much information through both mobile devices, but also other forms of digital devices. People have, have talked about this as being an entanglement that is almost impossible now for us to separate, impossible for us to get out of our, um, our devices. But one of the really critical questions that's being asked is one that not only relates to just use of technologies, but the use of technologies in educational contexts. And one of my uh, good colleagues, who's also a member of the Digital Education Research Group, a professor by the name of Neil Selwyn, wrote a book, and this is the cover from the book, where he simply asked, is technology good for education? The fact that he wrote a whole book about this probably indicates that the answer is not simple or, or easy. And one of the things that we find is that technology and online teaching and learning is very, very different to what goes on in face-to-face -face classes. And if you're a teacher and you've been teaching online over the last month or three, I bet that you've been finding that as well. And so one of the things that we need to think about is design. The way that we design our face-to-face -face classes and we have those kinds of interactions is probably something that we don't give too much thought to. It's probably something that we take for granted to a large extent. The kinds of ideas, the kinds of thoughts, the kinds of cues that we pick up on are ones that are often absent in our online teaching. The kinds of uh, things that we're looking for when we're uh, glancing across a classroom to understand whether students are uh, with me with what I'm talking about can be largely absent in this online kind of a setting. The ways in which we're able to communicate through different kinds of media, maybe having something projected onto a board or writing something onto a board and then supplementing that by being able to ask questions verbally and get responses straight away backwards is not necessarily present in a lot of our interactions online. So one of the things that we need to be thinking about are the affordances or options that are available to us through digital technologies, how we might consider both the opportunities but also the challenges they provide, and then how do we effectively and carefully design or uh, the most important learning that we can get in online spaces. So I wanna share with you three ideas that are going to hopefully um, give you some, not only ideas, but some tips and tricks about how you might do this in your own online classes. So there are three big ideas that I wanna to talk to you about. The first one is this idea about access. Access is um, something that we sort of uh, showed you some data just before about how much access students have. But just because they have a digital device and maybe a mobile phone, does that mean that they have access to all of the kinds of learning opportunities that you might want them to have on that mobile device? Is it appropriate for us to be thinking about them using this mobile device for hours and hours a day for deep engagement with maybe very rich media for learning? Is a small screen size really what we're after? We have to think about not only the actual access that people have, but also um, whether they have the uh, uh, 
access to be able to use the kinds of um, apps or programs or pieces of software that you might be wanting them to use. So if they're not able to actually install something on their device, because it's maybe not um, platform agnostic, it might only work on Windows devices, for example, or iOS devices, then we have some problems. Access, we think, is relatively simple, but it is more challenging when we start to rely on um, online teaching and learning as our only medium of interaction. So give some careful thought about the access that your students may or may not have, because that's going to shape uh, in a large part what you can or can't do in online spaces. But I want to spend most of my time with you today talking about these second two options, participation and engagement. So if we can get through the access component, the next thing we want to think about is uh, participation. So when we're talking about participation, I want to think about these four big ideas. And I want to give you some ways in which you might be able to structure your online teaching and learning to be able to take advantage of these. And the first one of these is to uh, establish participation because students know how to ask for help. In class, that's relatively easy. It might be putting up their hand to ask you as the teacher a question, or it might be that they actually just ask a friend who's sitting next to them. One of the challenges in online spaces is that, that asking a friend who's sitting next to them may not be quite as simple as it is in your face-to-face -face teaching. So we need to be very careful and very explicit to teach students and to encourage students to ask for help. So if you're a student and you're watching this, one of the things that I would encourage you to do is to not be shy or not be scared to ask for help because it's a really important part of being able to maximise your online learning opportunities. So how do we do that at Monash? Well, in my classes in online uh, uh, learning management systems, and, and we use Moodle, I make sure that I have things that are really, really explicit. So on one of the very first things that students see is an encouragement to ask for questions. But before they contact me, I ask them to think about four questions. The first one is, can my classmate answer the question? And if the answer is yes, then what I'm encouraging students to do is use a discussion forum. And in the bottom left-hand uh, corner of this slide, you'll see an example of a discussion forum that I've called a learning community forum. It's an open forum for questions and answers that are visible to everybody. So if it's not a question about a specific topic that I've set up a discussion forum for, I'll have a general open area where students are able to ask any kinds of questions. And what I encourage um, other students to do is try and answer those questions. Because the second part that I've put, uh, the second question that I ask is, is my question something that other students might be interested in? And if that's the case, then it's really helpful for me as a teacher to be putting that, having that question and an answer posted into a public discussion forum because it's going to save me work. It's going to save me answering that same question that probably lots of students have dozens and dozens of times. It means that I can just refer students to a particular discussion forum, which is much faster and much easier. But not all questions are great ones for discussion forums. So we need to think carefully about the kinds of ways in which um, questions differ. And so the third point question I ask my students is, is their question difficult to explain? Because if it's difficult to explain, it's unlikely to be um, easy to put into an email or into a discussion forum. It's going to take a really long time and a lot of typing for them to do that. It might actually be much faster for us to share a synchronous uh, web uh, conference on a platform like Zoom or Skype or something similar because I can say an awful lot more than I can type in the same period of time. The fourth question is, is my question urgent? And so um, if I'm normally in the office, I check my email much more than I check my phone. And that's very true when we're 
uh, teaching in these remote kinds of spaces. So I make sure that students know how to contact me. So if they're wanting to set up an, a one-on-one -on -one meeting, like the picture in the bottom right-hand side of this slide, they know how to get in touch with me and we're able to communicate using a variety of different media. This is a, a student who's uh, got some questions that they've actually popped into a Google Doc that we're working on collaboratively at the same time. The second thing that um, we have when we're starting to talk about um, participation is that we're, wa we're wanting to design systems so that students know how to study with and through technologies. Just because students are using their devices an awful lot for things like Facebook or Snapchat or Instagram or Twitter or whatever it is that they happen to be doing, the, that doesn't mean that they're necessarily able to be using um, devices for online learning. And learn, online learning is very different to online other forms of participation online. And so what you can see here is a message that I put up that I actually explain really explicitly uh, what, uh, how to use the website uh, to study. And so I give them instructions to say, each week you log into this site at least three times. When you log in, you can scroll down to the current week of study and see the activities and readings that we're recording. And it goes on. And then it's saying, the next heading is, well, what should I do? And then it's saying, every time that you log into the site, you should, one, check for any readings or activities in the relevant week. And it goes on and gives really explicit kinds of directions as to what it is that I want students to be doing. It's not assuming that just because they're using technologies in their social lives, in their day-to-day -day, uh, informal interactions, that that that's necessarily going to translate seamlessly into their online interactions in a, in a formal learning space. We have to, as teachers, be really explicit about what it is that we expect um, for students. The third component is to understand the culture and the norms of online participation, including what are appropriate forms of address and expression and contact. And so one of the things in terms of setting a culture that I do is in all of my classes, I make it very clear at the beginning that they only have one obligation, and that is they have to participate in discussion forums and other collaborative issues. And not only do they have to participate, but they have to give responses to their fellow students. They have to give feedback to their fellow students. And I explain why that is important about why I think that's valued. And so again, I give them some suggestions about how they can help create this culture. This isn't me as the teacher dominating this online space. This is saying we have this shared form of communication and I'm expecting you to communicate through this and these are the kinds of uh, values that I think are important in online spaces. So I'm encouraging students to be active and to help establish a culture in which there's a supportive kind of an environment. The fourth idea that I put up uh, a little bit earlier was that teachers and students co-develop rules of participation. And so what you can see here is a screenshot of this online space where I'm now starting to mix up text and audio. So students are able to read a little bit, but then they're able to listen to a little bit as well. And uh, in this particular course um, that I teach, I talk about multimedia design and the advantages and disadvantages of changing different forms of media on a page. And so what I'm trying to do is show them through their lived experience some of the things that I'm trying to, to teach them about from a theoretical point of view. But in here, what you'll see down to the, towards the bottom of, of this screenshot is that I'm encouraging students to build their own curriculum. I provide them with too much information for them to be able to go into depth on every single topic. Bearing in mind I'm dealing with mature age learners here, I'm encouraging them to take some form of control and responsibility over their learning, areas that they want to specialise in. 
they'll have to look at a little bit of everything, but the areas that they go deeper into are points of negotiation between me as the teacher and them as the student. Each student has the opportunity to participate in ways that they help contribute to or co-develop. So in doing those kinds of things, I'm undertaking a range of different roles. As a teacher, an online teacher, I have this pedagogical role where I'm asking questions and encouraging student knowledge building and designing different kinds of instructional activities and getting students to reflect upon their participation in those. I've also got a social role where I'm creating a friendly and nurturing environment or a community feel and we're generally trying to exhibit a positive tone. There's also a managerial role that I have as an online teacher where I'm coordinating assignments and due dates and ex extensions, assigning groups and partners and all of those kinds of pragmatic things that we do in classes in a face-to-face -face setting. But I still have this managerial role to be able to do that in an online space. And a very different kind of a role is a technical role. So often our students will have technological issues or they'll clarify problems um, or there'll be things just when technology doesn't work. And so I have this additional role of going in and uh, supporting people in a technical sense because once again, just because my students are potentially using a mobile phone or a tablet or something like that for their social interactions doesn't mean that when we're relying on technology for teaching and learning, things are always going to go smoothly. So the most important thing I think in uh, uh, being an online teacher is that we want to cultivate a healthy and engaging culture for online classes. And this takes time to develop. It's not something that's going to happen overnight. So it's one of those things that you need to be patient with and you need to consider carefully about how you're going to build that over time with your particular class. If we're talking then about engagement, so if we have students who are now participating, how do we get them to engage in meaningful ways? Ways that help them make a clearer sense of the information that we're providing to them. Well, in online spaces, we actually have some advantages, some affordances, ways of being able to represent content that we don't necessarily have in our face-to-face -face settings, or maybe not as easily at least. So meaningful engagement is relevant to students as much as it is to teachers. So there are two ways that I want you to consider online engagement. One is in regard to online communication or effectively managing interactions um, that uh, enhance online engagement. And the second one is through thoughtful online design. We need to carefully consider how uh, we present online information, otherwise people won't necessarily engage with our ideas. So what I want you to do is, is play a little game. This is a game that I get some of my students to play, to start to understand that the way that we actually engage online is not the same for all people. That there are differences in the ways that people uh, participate. And Julie Salmon is quite a famous Australian researcher who um, wrote a paper uh, where she tried to classify the ways that people engage in online spaces by um, uh, giving them a, an animal uh, metaphor to go with. So what I want you to do is just to have a little bit of fun for a moment and pick what sort of animal you might think you are online. And in just a moment, I'm going to show you what kinds of behaviours uh, Jilly Salmon suggested each of these sorts of uh, animals might have in an online space. All right, have you picked your animal? You know which one you want to be? So, here we go. Here comes the big reveal. So if you're a wolf, you visit once a week, you do lots of different things, and then you disappear again. I've just seen someone in the discussion suggest that they might be a dolphin. They're an intelligent, good communicator and playful online. 
I'd like to think I was like that, but actually probably my online interactions aren't necessarily quite that way. But irrespective of, of whatever animal you think you might have been, and this is again just a bit of fun, the point of this uh, is to suggest that not everybody interacts in the same way online. One of the types of people you might have seen is the idea of the rabbit, somebody who basically is online all the time. They're um, a prolific message writer and they respond really, really quickly. Anytime anyone puts a post into a discussion forum, they're onto it really quickly. So what we need to think about is if we're designing for effective engagement in online spaces, we need to cater for a wide range of different types of online behaviours and online interactions. This is not a one-size-fits-all approach. So we might want to start to think about how we best design for effective interaction and engagement. We want to pay attention to different ways we can communicate and which ones work best for the different kinds of students that we might have in a particular class. So one of the very easy ways to start thinking about different uh, designs for interaction are uh, simply the, the difference between synchronous and asynchronous forms of communication. Synchronous is in real time, sort of like this, where we might be having a backwards and forwards in a web conference or in a chat or in some video conferencing sorts of things. So if you were conducting a class on Zoom or Skype, that's a really good example of synchronous activities where things happen in real time. Asynchronous is where time has gets sort of stopped for a while. You might send off an email, for example, and not get a reply for a couple of hours or a day or two. There's time in between what you send out or what you post in the discussion forum before you get a response, much more time than you get in the synchronous setting. And so there are advantages and disadvantages with both of these. So if you have students who are confident to ask questions without necessarily having to think through them terribly much, they're willing to respond and they're willing to engage in real time, synchronous is fantastic, a great way for you to be able to engage students. But if you have a student who's really thoughtful and maybe is a little bit shy and doesn't necessarily want to ask a question in front of a large group of people, then a synchronous session is not going to work for that student. So we need to be thinking that if our classes are made up of different forms of online interactions, these different kinds of online animals, we might want to design for effective integration and engagement in different kinds of ways, to take advantage of the different kinds of interactions these sorts of tools provide for us, that we don't just necessarily rely on one uh, form or another. So if you're using email and discussion forums and those more asynchronous kinds of ideas, here are a couple of my top tips for managing email and discussion. Even though um, you might be saying, hi, everybody, it's a really good idea to think about using a greeting to set the tone and the audience. In the same way that when you walk into a class, one of the first things that you do in a face-to-face -face class is set the tone and the audience and the mood by your interaction. So thinking carefully about the way that you start um, an email or a post into a discussion forum is really good. Just like, hopefully, you don't do too much shouting in your face-to-face -face class, no shouting in online spaces. And that goes for students as much as it does for teachers. And so I make sure that that's something that we're really careful about communicating. So one of the things talking about expectations and culture, we have things so that in asynchronous settings, we have no shouting. We want things to be positive, so we avoid using negatives. One of the things that really bugs me is when I get an email that says re, 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 and then a subject line that has got nothing to do with whatever it is that the email is actually about because somebody's replied three or four times in a row and hasn't bothered to change the subject about what this email is about. It also makes it really hard if you're trying to look through discussion forums as a student to find a point that you know that you've read and it was about this thing, but there doesn't seem to be any subject field, in, like a topic uh, field, that tells you where it's easy to find that. 
So I encourage students to use descriptive subject fields that relate to the message that they're sending. There's a lot of research to suggest that if we break paragraphs into smaller units online, it's much, much easier for students to read it. There's a whole lot of work that's been done by a man called Jacob Nielsen, who talks about usability designs, where he uses eye tracking software and actually looks at where people are looking on a screen. And um, smaller paragraphs work much better than larger ones in online spaces. If you do have to have a long email or a long discussion forum, think about using a bit of a table of contents at the start. So you might start off by using a good greeting to set the tone and audience. And then you might say, I apologize for this being a long email or a long discussion forum post. There are four big ideas that I want to try to convey to you. And then you list what those four things are and then you use little headings as you're going through. So you're breaking this up into blocks, into chunks so that it's easier for people to understand what's going on. Even when you do that sometimes, things can go a little bit wrong. So like in face-to-face -face classes, there can be bullying through domination or blocking out of st certain students by other ones, or some students might be rude to someone else. And in just the same way that you uh, would react to that in your face-to-face -face class, you need to establish that culture online by coming up with some strategies or some ideas about how you might, for example, get students who don't participate to get involved. So if you've got a lurking student, one who you know is online, but they're not necessarily communicating very much with other people, one of my favorite strategies is this idea of a whisper, where what I might do is I might um, just send an email to that particular student and say, oh, I happen to notice in this particular discussion forum, there was a post from this particular student and they seem to be having some difficulties with this idea. I was wondering if you might jump in and just help them by giving them a bit of an answer. And so having a little bit of an off um, the, the forum whisper through an email or some other form of communication and suggesting that they might be able to help in some way can get students who might be lurking to be able to get involved in really good ways. So I want to share a couple more of my favourite tips for online teaching. So when managing online classes, don't give people too many things to do. You might have 50 things that you want students to do, but they're not going to be able to do that in a, in a timely kind of a way. So limit how many things you want people to do. Also limit the number of big emails or posts that you as the teacher send out. So typically I will send out one email or one um, bulletin to give people an idea about what it is that I want them to be doing over the next period of time, often around about a week in higher education. It might be shorter in your particular context. But if you're sending out lots and lots of emails, you've probably got someone who does that to you. How do you respond when you see the same name pop up for the seventh, eighth, ninth time in a day? You tend to ignore those emails for a little bit longer. So if you want maximum impact with your students, limit the number of broadcast emails and try to set a rhythm by sending broadcast emails at around the same time, either of the day or the week. When you're facilitating forums or blogs or wikis, have a forum for resolving problems. So you saw that one of mine earlier on, a learning community forum, where people can put in questions about anything that they want to. If you don't have that general sort of an idea, then it makes it hard for students to find a, a suitable place to be asking questions and for us to then be resolving problems as a group. One of the larger things that I encourage students to do is think about the quality of their interactions, not necessarily the quantity. More doesn't always make it better. There are a couple of other tips there for you. Um, the idea of, of weaving is uh, blending uh, different parts of conversations together in, in a post. That um, means that you're making connections for your students if they're not making connections between different ideas. And summarizing obviously is helpful, when, particularly when you're getting towards the end of a topic. To make it easier for yourself to cope with online learning, 
try and log in regularly, particularly if your students are posting lots of things. Because it, if you're a teacher or a student, there's nothing worse than logging in after four, five, six days and seeing dozens and dozens of unread messages. You just don't know where to start. So log in regularly, and if you're the teacher, um, then just let your students know if you're not going to be online for a couple of days over the weekend or something like that. They're then not going to be waiting around one, for, a, for a response to a question. They'll know that you're offline for a day or two over the weekend. Try and find a routine and communicate it. And one of the big routines that I have is I always start a, a course or tasks or the setting of homework midweek. It's really, really tempting to start off the next topic on a Monday. But what I've tended to find is that if you're anything like me, what that will mean is that you're preparing a lot of those materials the day before you start that new topic or two days before, which means you're working on your Saturday and your Sunday. So think carefully about your own work-life balance, particularly when we're not able to physically often separate those at the current time. And think about making sure you get a bit of a break from your online teaching. Starting a topic midweek is a fantastic way for you to be able to do that. The last thing that I wanted to talk with you about is designing materials for online engagement. If we actually don't design things in a thoughtful and clear way, if we don't set them out, it doesn't matter how good we are at um, logging in regularly. It doesn't matter how good we are at setting up things like discussion forums. If we don't present the content in ways that allow students to easily engage with it, it's going to be very, very difficult for them to participate and engage in meaningful ways. So one idea that I really wanted to, to uh, quickly talk to you about is this idea of cognitive load theory. It comes from an information processing family of theories about learning, and it's focused on memory and storage. And essentially what it says is, the more things that we try to get people to be thinking about at the same time, the harder it is for them to memorize certain things or take on board certain parts of the information and store that information in their long-term memory. It's a bit more complicated than that, but essentially that's the idea of this particular theory. One of the other key components of this is that when we have something in our long-term memory, we use that idea to make sense of new information that we see. You think, ah, oh, I've seen something like that before. It relates to this other thing that I've seen, uh, that I'm seeing now. So that helps me make sense of what's going on. It helps me make meaning of something new. I want to give you an example of what this means. So I want you to take a look at the following two things and, and let me uh, have a bit of a think about what you see. If you're like most people, the first line, you'll probably read the cat. And the second line, you'll tell me they're all the letter A. It's a really interesting thing that if most, like most people, you thought that because in the first line, the T in the and the A in cat are actually the same letter or the same representation. So you're telling me if you saw the cat that the two things in that first line that are the same are actually different. Tell me one's an H and one's an A, yet they're both the same thing. You can't help but make meaning out of what you see by drawing on your long-term memory. If you said on the second line all those things were the letter A, you're doing the opposite to what happened on the first line. You're telling me that everything that is different on that line is the same thing. And that's because you've seen lots and lots of letter A before, and you've seen lots of people's handwriting that looks different. It's sort of the same, but it's a bit different. And this theory helps us to understand why we can read lots of different people's handwriting, because what we see actually uh, and what we remember depends more on what we already know than what's presented. And we can't help but impose many, usually or often derived um, from the context that they're in, um, on the things that we see or hear. And we derive this meaning from things in our long-term memory. 
So we can actually use this idea to help us uh, structure or, or group or chunk things in ways that make it easier for our students rather than harder, particularly in online spaces. So if we're trying to give people a large number of elements to remember, it's often helpful to try and combine them in some way to make a smaller group of things that they need to remember. This is sometimes called chunking. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to give you about 20 seconds to try to memorise a shopping list. It's a shopping list that is in columns and in rows and I want you to try and memorise without typing anything down or writing anything at home. I want you to try and remember the order of each of these things. Okay? So I'm going to give you 20 seconds to try and memorise this. You ready? Go. Five seconds left. All right, how did you go? What I'm going to do now is I'm going to show you the same number, or the same, exactly the same list, just ordered in a different way. I'm going to give you 15 seconds to try and memorize it this time, again, in order. All right, ready? Here we go. So which one's easier to remember, do you think? I'm tipping you said the last one, and I'm tipping when I show you both of these things uh, side by side, one on top of the other, you can see why. It's because in the second list, we've grouped things that draw on your long-term memory. You know that apples and oranges and bananas are all types of fruit. So instead of having to remember uh, a set in the first list, that don't necessarily have any connection in, in their columns, in the second list, all you needed to largely remember was fruit and then maybe something about sandwiches and then something about bathroom products and then something about stationery or something like that. And all of a sudden, you've got an overarching idea that allows you to try and uh, use that as a chunk to remember these different kinds of things. If we take advantage of that, by presenting things to our students in ways that connect with things that they already know, that they've already done before, then it makes it so much easier for them when they're reading anything online to understand what it is that connects these things together or draws them back to something that they might have seen before. It's also the way that we structure things in, whoops, in online spaces, sorry. So what I want you to do is I'm going to give you two seconds to take a look at the following uh, statement and just try and memorise the sequence of letters and spaces. Ready? Here we go. How'd you go? Were you able to do that? Probably not. But if we were to do this instead and change the sequence of letters and spaces, is that easier? They're exactly the same thing. It's just that the spaces and the combinations of letters, again, draw on things that you're familiar with, that you've seen before, that you understand, that you know, and you can um, memorise much faster and much more easily. So um, start to think about ways in which you're able to uh, present information in online spaces that help your students if you're wanting them to memorise or remember lots of different pieces of information. New information can be memorised if it connects with something that's been held in long-term memory and it becomes easier to remember. Really, really, really important in online spaces. So there are three big ideas about designing for online success. Make sure that you have students who can access information uh, in online spaces, not just because they actually have a device, but that device is appropriate and reasonable for what it is that you're wanting them to do, that they can access the different kinds of software that you're wanting, and that they're able to do that in a sustainable way over a longer period of time. 
I've given you lots of different ideas about participation, about ways to establish different kinds of uh, ideas like a, an online culture, about ways to be able to ask for help, about ways to be able to think about um, what it is that you're wanting students to do and clearly communicating that with them in each of your uh, classes. And the final part about engagement, thinking about meaningful engagement uh, through the design of online learning activities. Uh, through some of those different kinds of ways we can chunk information, we can structure it so that it makes it easier for our students to engage with our online materials. So hopefully that gives you an idea about where to start. Don't think about these things necessarily as just online teaching and learning. Start thinking about online doing. Start somewhere, start small, and start where success for you as a teacher is most likely. If you're a student, do exactly the same thing. Because once we start on those smaller, uh, more achievable kinds of activities, we can then build things and start to get more exciting and different uh, forms of engagement in our online classes and spaces.